Uh, thanks, Michael, once again, all yours. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And it's really nice to be here today virtually with you all and have this opportunity to talk about some of my lab's research. Uh, so uh, my lab studies how the brain comes to represent our experiences in our environment and how this in turn affects the way we perceive and interact with the world. Today, I'm going to be talking specifically about how topographic maps constrain early brain development and, and promote stereotypical behaviors. And so I've been exploring this in the realm of primate vision, specifically object vision. Uh, primates are visual animals. Our visual perception is fast and accurate. We can effortlessly detect and classify objects in our environment, even within a fraction of a second. Uh, and that's despite the tremendous variation an individual object can produce on our retina. And the way we interact with our visual environment has surprising consistency. Uh, many aspects of visual perception and behavior are comparable, not just across individuals, but also across species. Uh, so, for example, individual humans and chimps tend to look at similar salient features in natural scenes, uh, such as other people, especially uh, the faces of other people compared to other body parts, and that's illustrated here in these top two panels. Can you see my cursor when I move it around? Or Yes. Yes, cool. Okay. just want to make sure that when I'm referring to things, you all know what I'm referring to. Cool. So the, in these top two panels, uh, you can see these black dots are fixation points measured when humans and chimps were looking at this example of natural scene. And you can see that they're spending a lot of time looking at the faces in these images. Uh, further, as, as seen below in these, these bottom graphs, humans and monkeys perform similarly on complex object recognition tasks, where they're asked to identify a variety of objects that have been embedded within natural scenes. And they can do this uh, across a, variant, a variety of viewpoints and scaling of those objects. Uh, and what's particularly impressive is that humans and monkeys tend to make similar errors. And that, that's most evident in this uh, graph on the right here. Uh, so that is on a given uh, trial where the uh, human or monkey are asked to discriminate a particular object they both tend to either get it correct or they both tend to get it wrong. And so data such as these uh, really indicate that there's some common neural architecture supporting these visual functions across individuals as well as across primate species. Uh, such visual behavior is supported not just by a single brain region, but probably by a rich mosaic of functionally specialized regions. And the central focus of my lab research is how these regions come to represent our environment and our experiences over development. Uh, one of the challenging aspects to identifying functions and organizing principles that are common to primates and common across individuals is that there's considerable anatomical variability. Uh, and that's evident here in this, this slide where you can see how much larger the human brain is and how many more folds there are along the cortical surface than the macaque monkey brain. Even though I was just talking about in the prior slide, uh, similarities in their visual behavior. Further, there's variability not just across species, uh, but also across individuals as well. And this is particularly true for humans where the uh, particular folding patterns of the cortical surface can vary considerably from subject to subject or individual to individual. Uh, despite this variability, there are several functionally specialized um, regions that are located in inferior temporal cortex that support our visual behavior and our ability to recognize complex visual information, visual information uh, such as faces. Several of these individual regions appear to be selective for particular behavioral important behaviorally important categories, uh, such as faces, body parts, objects, or places. So I'm showing you here data from a fMRI imaging study. Uh, these parts of the monkey brain are color coded uh, such that they, they uh, correspond to the type of visual stimulus that evoke the strongest response in that part of cortex. Uh, so for the majority of this talk, I'm going to be showing you a lot of these types of images of the macaque brain. Uh, and just to help orient some people who are maybe less familiar with the macaque brain, um, this is what the macaque brain looks like in, in real life. Uh, and what we do is we, we put the macaque monkeys in MRI scanners and we scan their brain and we get these volumetric images of the anatomy. And then we can segment the cortical surface and create these uh, 3D mesh models uh, of the, the folded brain, but then we can sort of inflate the brains, make them balloon out. And the nice property about this is that we can look now visualize the cortical surface that's buried within the sulci. So you can see here, we can't really see in the, the crevice right here what the cortical surface is, but now that all has been inflated in this view. 
Uh, and just to give you a little bit of lay of the land of, of, of uh, macaque cortex, back here is occipital cortex. This is where primary visual cortex V1 is. Over here in the label IPS is the intraparietal sulcus, uh, which is often uh, associated with dorsal visual stream processing, uh, also multimodal representations of visual, somatomotor, and auditory representations. Moving to anterior is the central sulcus, where primary somatomotor cortex is. And then further anterior is the arcuate sulcus and prefrontal cortex. But for the purposes of this talk, we're mainly going to be focus, focusing on IT cortex or inferior temporal cortex, which is located over here in the macaque monkey. Uh, that's largely located within the superior temporal sulcus, sometimes referred to as the STS. And in particular, uh, the, these uh, regions that seem to be specialized for particular visual categories like faces and objects are located uh, on the lower bank of the STS that straddle uh, both sides of the, the, the STS. And so this is fMRI data. This samples an individual uh, data point sampled in fMRI is sampling from tens of thousands of neurons, uh, if not more. Um, but we know from uh, nice studies, such as uh, this landmark study from Doris Sow, that pretty much all the neurons within that region, uh, that fMRI defined region, are selected for that category. So what she did with, with Marge Livingston when she was a grad student is she uh, performed an fMRI in these monkeys, localized a face patch, and then systematically recorded from all the neurons there and found that pretty much all those neurons uh, were selectively active. So they fired when the monkey was looking at a face. And the activity of those neurons uh, was a little modulated. So it didn't differ from baseline activity uh, when the monkey was looking at other types of objects like bodies and fruits and gadgets. And we know that these reasons aren't just selective for these, uh, for these types of um, uh, complex shapes, but they're important for normal behavior uh, and recognition of the, these types of objects. Because we know from lesion studies, damage to these regions can lead to specific deficits in, in recognition of those corresponding categories. So if in this monkey, this red region, which is highly selective for faces with damage, this monkey would have a hard time recognizing faces even though this, the, the broader visual capacity and behavior of this monkey wouldn't largely be impacted. So the monkey could recognize other things in its environment. Uh, and these clusters are found in pretty much all normal individuals. Uh, and they've been shown to exist in several primate species such as macaques and humans and more recently in marmosets. And the presence of these regions across primates and their stereotypical location across individuals suggests that there must be a common influence guiding this organization. And just to make that point clear about the stereotypical location, it's if I look in five different macaque monkeys in this part of cortex, I'm very likely to find face selectivity in that same region. Same thing for humans. If I look in this part of the human brain across individuals, I'll probably find face selective uh, neurons there. So uh, a major question, has been, well, how are these regions emerging in these very typical locations and how are these uh, present in multiple primate species? And one of the prominent arguments for this is that these functions uh, have emerged over the course of evolution. That's why they're there in multiple primate species and they're innately predetermined. They have some sort of genetic pre-specification that's saying this is the part of cortex where this, this selectivity emerges and that can explain this consistency. However, there are also clusters in human IT cortex that are involved in word processing. And these clusters are dependent on visual experience, specifically literacy. Uh, so it's shown here in, for six-year-old kids right around the age when, when, when children learn to read. Uh, children that have learned to read have this region highlighted here in green that's often referred to as the visual word form area that's selective when uh, an individual is looking at words as compared to when the individual is looking at faces or other types of complex shapes. And in uh, six-year-olds who haven't learned to read, that region isn't there yet. So there's a strong component of experience that's driving whether or not this region is there. And while monkeys don't naturally read, uh, text regions can be induced in young monkeys through intensive early training. So this was a study done by my postdoc advisor, Marge Livingstone, years ago, where she took young monkeys and trained them to discriminate different Helvetica letters. And sure enough, after training, she scanned these monkeys and this region was active when the monkey was looking at Helvetica font more than when the monkey was looking at faces or other types of objects. And interestingly, similar to the face patches, these word and text regions appeared in stereotype locations. So their location was consistent across individuals. So here we have experience dependent brain regions that exhibit these properties of brain organization that are typically associated with arguments for predetermined function. 
So despite decades of research on the function supporting object rec recognition, how these regions are coming to support our visual perception for our ability to recognize, for example, faces has remained mysterious. So over the past several years, uh, we've been researching this question by studying the development of the cortical face network uh, in, in macaques. And, and we're using the face network really as a proxy for studying development of high level vision in general. Uh, we think that the, the uh, findings that we have from the development of the face network can be applied to high level vision more broadly. So for today's talk, I'm going to review the main findings from our initial studies, looking at the development of the face network in macaques, and then discuss some recent extensions of this work. So starting off, we know what that organization is in adult macaques. In IT cortex, there are, there are several of these di spatially distinct regions that are selected for faces. Up until a couple of years ago, it wasn't known whether or not these regions existed or what the organization is in IT cortex in juvenile or newborn monkeys. So the first study we ran was to look at and answer whether or not face patches are present at birth. So to do this, uh, we used fMRI in our monkeys. Uh, we started scanning our monkeys uh, just after the first week uh, after birth, and we scanned them longitudinally pretty much every week for the first two years uh, after birth. And we used a very standard fMRI block design approach uh, this is a very sort of bread and butter staple way of, of measuring selectivity uh, with fMRI, where we show these blocks, there are 20 second blocks comprising different faces. Uh, and then we showed uh, different, uh, in a different part of the experiment, 20 second blocks of familiar objects. And these are objects that the monkey visually experiences in its colony room. And in between these blocks of face and object uh, stimulation, we just had the monkey passively fixate without any visual stimulation. And that just uh, allows us to better isolate activity that's uh, specifically evoked by looking at the faces compared to activity uh, evoked looking at the objects. Uh, and so just to remind you, in adults, uh, the, these face patches are typically in IT cortex, highlighted here in red. So we've wondered when uh, would we first detect these face patches in our baby monkeys? By about 200 days of age, in each of the monkeys we scanned, we identified face selective clusters within these parts of IT cortex that typically have face clusters in the adults. And that's highlighted here in these yellow and orange regions. Uh, and after 200 days, in each of the monkeys, every single scan session, these face patches were, were present. So here's data at 400 days and data at just shy of 800 days. And just flipping back and forth between these, I think you can appreciate how rock solid these clusters are. Once they're there, they're, they're locating the same space at, uh, scan session after scan session. They're pretty much the same size. Um, they, they vary a little bit maybe depending on the threshold and the signal to noise of, of, of that day. Prior to 200 days though, we did not detect these face clusters in our monkeys. And this is even at a very liberal threshold compared to the normal threshold that we use for fMRI. So we're not seeing hints early on of this face selectivity. That's not to say that this part of the brain isn't visually responsive. It responded robustly both to the faces and to the objects. There's just no differential in the magnitude of the response between faces and objects. Um, so together, uh, we, we, across all these scans, uh, we take this as evidence that the face patches aren't there at birth. They're not, they don't have this uh, functional maturation selectivity that we see uh, typically in adult mon monkeys. And so that could be, uh, that could indicate that early experience is necessary for the development of these uh, domains. Uh, but we do know that the, the um, visual system and, and more broadly the brain uh, is immature at birth. So even neurons within B1 uh, do not have uh, uh, that sort of uh, adult-like uh, maturation response properties uh, at, until, the, until several weeks or even months after, after birth. So it could be that uh, these face patches just have a protracted development and would emerge after 200 days, irregardless of uh, what the monkey is experiencing. So to test this, we raised uh, baby monkeys for the first year of life without seeing faces. So we hand reared these monkeys uh, and we wore these welders masks so they couldn't see the details of our face. They would interact with us, uh, they'd see our hands, they'd become familiar with us. They just never saw the details of our face and they were raised in a separate room from the other monkeys so they didn't see faces of other monkeys. Here's an example of one of the many feeding sessions 
for baby monkeys, uh, like adult, oh, like baby humans. Uh, early on, you need to feed these guys every uh, couple hours throughout the whole day and well into the night. Um, and, and we played with these monkeys uh, several times a day. So this is just highlight that we tried to provide them as stimulating of an environment as possible. Um, so they, they became, for example, Peter here played with uh, monkey Nina several times a day. So Nina became very uh, attached and, and familiar with, uh, with Peter and, and the rest of the lab. And again, we, we scanned these monkeys with fMRI using the same type of block design approach. Uh, in addition to faces and, and familiar objects, we used hands. Uh, and that's because we thought they became very familiar with their hands. It sort of was the most salient feature uh, of our bodies that they interacted with. Uh, we also used hands as a stimulus because we know in control monkeys after 200 days, IT, in, within IT cortex, there are also hand selective regions. They're located in uh, pretty much adjacent parts of IT cortex relative to the face regions in our control monkeys. So the question is, are face regions, do face regions develop after 200 days in, in these monkeys raised without seeing faces? Uh, and in fact, across three monkeys, several scan sessions throughout that whole year, we didn't see face clusters in any of these monkeys, any of these scan sessions. This is a sort of composite image across all those uh, scans and monkeys, but in none of the scan sessions did we ever see face clusters within IT cortex or in other parts of, of the brain. We did see in each scan session though, hand selective clusters within the approximate locations that we would expect based on control monkeys. And this is a really nice demonstration that this selective rearing of the, these monkeys without seeing faces had a selective impairment on the development where uh, face selectivity did not emerge, but that did not impair the broader development of IT cortex. So these hand selective regions naturally developed over the first several months of, of these monkeys. In addition to this lack of uh, development of, of face selective clusters, uh, the visual behavior of our, our monkeys raised without seeing faces was very different from control monkeys. So our control monkeys, like uh, uh, other studies in, in adult monkeys and, and adult humans and, and baby humans, uh, preferentially look at faces in natural scenes. Uh, so that's highlighted here in these heat maps, and you can see that they're, they're strongest for where the faces are in these images. And in contrast, our face-deprived monkeys tended not to look at the faces, but looked rather at the hands and feet of monkeys and humans. Uh, so these are just two example images, one, one example session. We tested our monkeys repeatedly over the course of the first year. Uh, green are all the monkeys raised without seeing faces, different symbols are different monkeys. Uh, the white outlines are the across session averages for each of the monkeys. And you can see that here, the, the uh, monkeys raised without seeing faces preferentially looked at those hands more than looking at the faces and really more than looking at any other features in, in, in these natural images. Uh, and the, the control monkeys, in contrast, preferentially looked at faces consistent with the wealth of other studies out there showing uh, this, this uh, sort of natural tendency to look at faces or face-like images. So taken together, uh, this highlights how important visual experience is for the development of face patches and, and sort of quote unquote normal visual behavior in these monkeys. This leads us to the question of how are these, uh, how is this experience driving the development of face patches? And we got a hint of this from looking at the uh, looking behavior in our, our uh, control monkeys. So even within the first week after birth, these monkeys preferentially looked at faces and face-like images in these natural images. And that's well before when these face clusters, these, these face domains in IT cortex, develop in those same monkeys. And I'm just highlighting that region when we first start to detect those face clusters here in blue. Uh, so that's well before the, 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 this sort of uh, circuitry of, of the brain that's very specialized in processing faces emerges. So we think this early looking of faces may be driving the subsequent development of and specialization in IT cortex. Uh, so unpack that a little bit further, very early on, monkeys are preferentially looking at faces. So that information is coming into the retina, it's getting relayed through the geniculate to V1 and somehow propagating throughout the visual system uh, to these particular parts of, of uh, IT cortex where the selectivity eventually emerges over the first couple of months of development. So what is the architecture of the brain that could be supporting this development of face clusters in such stereotypical locations in IT cortex? 
And we think what might be going on here is uh, that the retina topic organization is providing this pathway for experience to be elaborated within specific parts of the visual system. So we know in adult humans and monkeys that the visual system comprises a series of retinotopic maps. And that is neighboring parts, uh, neighboring neurons in, on cortex receive input uh, either directly or indirectly from neighboring parts of the retina and thereby are representing neighboring parts of visual space. Uh, so more broadly, there, there is this sort of smooth gradient of, represent, of, of representation of visual space where here red regions are, are regions that represent foveal space where the monkey is fixating. And then surrounding that are representations of parafoveal space, uh, increasing from the sort of orange color coding yellow into green is getting into maybe more peripheral space and, and blue is, is farther peripheral space. So very early on the monkey, monkeys are fixating on faces, which means that that information could be relayed to specific retinotopic representations in the brain. And it's been noted in adult humans and adult monkeys that there's this correspondence between face patches and the retinotopic organization such that face patches in IT cortex overlap or correspond to foveal representations within IT. So if these retinotopic maps are there early in birth, they're providing this pathway from the retina to IT cortex where face information could be relayed to spatially specific locations of IT cortex. So we asked whether or not these retinotopic maps are there at birth. We know that the face selectivity is not there at birth. So is there any organization early on that, that could be relaying this information in a systematic fashion? Uh, so to answer this, we, we again turn to scanning our, our newborn monkeys. One of the nice advantages about fMRI compared to doing uh, electrophysiology is that you get a picture of the whole brain. So you can, it's really well suited for mapping out the, these maps across the whole visual system. Uh, but the challenge with scanning these newborn monkeys is that within the first, for the first week to three weeks, they tend to sleep a lot in the scanner. Uh, after about three weeks a month, they, they become much more engaged with the experiment. They're actually really interested in the visual stimuli that we're showing, they'll stay awake. But for the first couple of weeks, like baby humans, they just spend a lot of time sleeping. And so it makes it impossible pretty much to do conventional retinotopic mapping where we have to train monkeys to maintain a central fixation for an extended period of time where we present stimuli at different parts of the visual field. So instead of using conventional retinotopic mapping approaches, we opted for using uh, what could be called a correlation mapping approach. So we're scanning these monkeys while they're sometimes awake, sometimes asleep. We're measuring what could be considered spontaneous activity. And we're doing this across the whole brain. So different parts of the brain, we're measuring the temporal activity patterns, when activity is high, when activity is low. Uh, and then we just correlate, so we compute these temporal correlations between different parts of the brain. And so we ask, you know, is area A more correlated with area B versus area C? And we assess this particularly in, in relationship to the retinotopic organization. So we're asking whether foveal regions are more correlated with each other than with peripheral regions and whether peripheral regions are more correlated with each other than foveal regions. And we have, and we know in these monkeys, so we've been scanning these newborn monkeys for, we scanned them for two years. So later in life, we can actually measure their retinotopic maps as shown here in older monkey. And then we can now use that to estimate where the retinotopic representations would be in the younger monkeys. And when we do that, we compute these correlations and we just cluster the data to see what the larger, the, the broader structure is. We find these smooth topographic maps throughout the whole visual system. So we see that correlations are specific. The temporal correlations of activity are specific to the visual system and have a topographic structure where these red regions all have highly correlated activity that are more correlated with each other than other parts of the visual system. These green regions surrounding it are more correlated with each other than other parts of the visual system. And then these medial blue regions are more correlated with each other than other parts of the visual system. And this structure, corresponds well with the eccentricity maps that we measure in the same monkeys when they're older. Specifically, this lateral occipital extending into inferior temporal cortex all represents sort of foveal, uh, sort of central two to three degrees of visual space. And that all 
in our correlation approach, uh, all, the, all those regions were highly correlated with each other more than other regions. And then the surrounding regions represent parafovial space, and those surrounding regions are very correlated with each other. And then these sort of peripheral medial regions were all correlated with each other. And a particularly nice feature about these correlation maps is that embedded within the STS is this region of red that is correlated with this more lateral region. And indeed, that actually corresponds to the fulvial representation of the MT, which is of uh, the retinotopic area MT, which is uh, separate from the fulvial representations of uh, posterior visual cortex. So from, this, it, from these correlation uh, approaches, it uh, indicates to us that these retinotopic maps are there very early in life. Now, there's a limitation to the study that this is all correlation. We're not uh, looking at stimulus evoked responses. Uh, but recently in a collaboration with Cameron Ellis and Nick Turk Brown at Yale, uh, we've shown that in humans, infant humans, as early as five months old, that's the earliest that they scanned, uh, these infants have retinotopic maps. And this is through direct uh, conventional approaches of retinotopic mapping. So the stimulus evoked activity uh, verifies that the retinotopic maps are there at birth and responsive to particular parts of visual space. And this is part of a larger set of studies that Cameron has been doing as part of his PhD work in, in Nick's lab, uh, looking at the organization and response properties of early, um, of, of young infants and humans. Uh, so together, th this, uh, we, this demonstrates that retinotopic maps we think are there at, at birth. Even though uh, the earliest we measured these maps in baby monkeys was about 10 days of age, uh, we think that the maps are really there day one. Uh, they're not emerging over that first week of, of development, but they're, they're really established there even before uh, the, uh, an individual experiences its environment. So putting these studies together, uh, we're proposing a model for face patch development where very early on there's a, a proto-architecture. We think this is a sort of topograph, a series of topographic maps in, in the visual system, this is retinotopic maps that impose a uh, constraints, wiring constraints on how the uh, visual system communicates uh, across the whole, the whole visual system. And that's interacting with early visual experience. And that can explain the, the uh, prenatal, uh, the postnatal development emergence of the, the selectivity for, uh, for particular uh, high level visual cat categories like faces. So very early on, monkeys are fixating on faces, that information is getting relayed through this retinotopic cortex in a very stereotypical fashion. Uh, and that can explain the, the emergence of these, um, these, these face selective clusters in stereotypical domains, uh, these stereotypical locations of, of, of IT cortex without uh, having to have a pre-specification of their function, without any sort of genetic specification saying that these domains must emerge there. This naturally emerges based on really the regularities with which we're experiencing and, and visually interacting with our environment. And we think that this, uh, this is a, a generalizable model for cortical development that uh, beyond just the visual system where early on the, the brain comprises a series of topographic representations and these interact with species specific and maybe even individual specific experience to promote the, the uh, the uh, postnatal refinement of the circuitry and specializations that emerge, such as the uh, face domains. Uh, and I highlight individual experience because this, this, this calls back to Marge's earlier study inducing text domains in uh, these monkeys, where these monkeys were trained. So they looked at these Helvetica fonts in a very stereotypical fashion, but though only those individual monkeys developed text domains. Uh, so we've been exploring the, this broader model of cortical development uh, in a more general fashion beyond the visual system. Uh, so we have we've shown that there are these visual maps at birth, but what about the rest of cortex? Uh, are there other sensory systems that have maps at birth? So uh, to look at this, we uh, have been looking at the uh, organization of the somatomotor system in, in these baby macaque monkeys. Uh, so we know from adult studies that there's a coarse uh, map of the body within the central sulcus, so it's where primary somatomotor cortex is, uh, such that ventral regions represent the face, and then moving more dorsal, there are representations of the hand and then the arm, and then move more dorsal, there are representations of the trunk and the leg and the foot. So we're combined, there's this coarse, maybe disjointed, but 
coarse topographic map of the body in adults. And so we wanted to know whether this uh, map was there in our newborn monkeys. Uh, and sure enough, we find that uh, we, we put the monkeys, these baby monkeys as early as 11 days in the scanner and we stimulate their faces, their hands and their legs. And we find evoked activity uh, for face stimulation, hand stimulation, leg stimulation. And the spatial location and the extent of this activation corresponded well with the maps that we find in older monkeys. And this is true not just for cortex, but for subcortex, including the putamen, globus pallidus, and the area VP of the thalamus. So pretty much every area that we're finding somatomotor representations in our adult monkeys, we already find those maps in our 11-day-old monkeys. And they're virtually indistinguishable, uh, at least at this scale, uh, to our older monkeys. That is, the, the similarity of these maps between an 11-day-old monkey and a two-year-old monkey is that similarity is just as strong as the similarity between one two-year-old monkey and a second two-year-old monkey. So from this, uh, we can conclude that body maps are also present at birth, these, these topographic representations of uh, somatomotor space. So that sort of begs the question, what are they good for? I was just talking about how visual maps, uh, these visual retinotopic maps, promote the, the, the uh, development of face domains in visual cortex. What are these body maps promoting the development of? And to be honest, we have no data on this. Uh, we haven't been, conducted such experiments. Uh, so it's purely speculative, but I think we can um, come up with a, a good hypothesis based on what we know about the adult uh, somatomotor system. And that is, in addition to the, this uh, somatotopic organization, uh, mo the motor system contains these motor domains that are important for the execution and coordination of uh, what's been described as ethologically relevant actions for, for monkeys. And so this is first shown in uh, studies by Mike Graziano, where he uh, lowered electrodes in different parts of the motor system and induced current. And he noticed that these monkeys, by inducing current in specific parts of motor cortex, uh, evoked very stereotypical motor behaviors in these monkeys. And these were not just like flinches or small movements of different body parts, but very coordinated movements like clean, climbing and leaping. These were uh, stereotypical such that if you put the electrode in the same part of motor cortex in different monkeys and it induced current, you'd get the same you know, behavior in, in these uh, different monkeys. And domains, there, there seem to be different domains. So there's sort of a climbing leaping domain, below, more ventral to that is a region that if, if current is induced, the monkey will sort of reach out and grasp something, even if there's no object in, its, in, its, uh, in front of it. Uh, there are regions that uh, if stimulated, the monkey will, will bring its hand to its mouth like it's eating something, or just other regions that will induce chewing and licking of, of the monkey. Uh, and so there are features to these domains that parallel the similarities between face domains in the visual system in the retinotopic maps. And that is that they're in stereotypical locations and they have a correspondence to the somatomotor representations uh, such that the body parts that seem to be really important for executing the, the particular actions of that domain correspond to the somatotopic representation. So looking at this climbing leaping domain, hands and feet are particularly important for the execution of climbing and leaping. And that domain overlaps or seems to overlap with representations of both the feet and legs and hand and arms. Or looking at the reaching and grasping domain, this domain seems to be fall, falls within the region that represents the hand and the arm or hand to mouth seems to straddle the representations, both of hand representations, as well as the mouth representations. So we think that there's this nice parallel here where really early on there's this topographic proto-architecture that's providing a, a pathway for the flow of information and communication between regions within the somatomotor system that's interacting with early experience. And baby monkeys, like baby humans, are terribly uncoordinated in their motor behavior uh, at birth. They lack that fine motor skills uh, that, that emerge over the course of the first several months and years of, of life. And we think that as monkeys early on are exploring their space, uh, they're naturally climbing and leaping around. They're not naturally learning to reach out and grasp things or bring food to their mouth. Uh, that early experience is interacting with this early topographic architecture uh, to promote the development of the specialization, these specialized domains in stereotypical uh, locations. 
Um, so that remains to be tested whether or not these domains are there at birth, but I, I speculate similar to the face domains, they aren't there at birth, given also the immaturity, the behavioral immaturity of these monkeys, and that these, are, these would emerge over the course of the first several months and will emerge in parallel to the, the refinement of the actual motor behaviors. Uh, so underlying all these studies, is the assertion that maps are, are fundamental uh, to the organization of cortex and provide the early scaffolding for how uh, the uh, brain wires up postnatally and, and, and refines itself to, to promote the development of these specializations. So I talked about two studies that highlight the, the visual and somatomotor topographic representations. And just a composite of those two images here, you can really appreciate how much of cortex is covered by topographic maps in the macaque monkey. And, and I think that's true for the human as well. Um, and here highlighted in pink is auditory cortex. So we know in adults, there are tonotopic maps. So these topographic maps of auditory space. We haven't done the studies in newborn monkeys to test this, but I, I would expect that those maps are also there at birth. And I'd actually speculate that the whole cortex is topographically organized, even frontal uh, and, and association cortices that maybe don't have as clear of a direct representation of sensory space, that, that re topographic representation is probably more abstract, but I bet the underlying organizing principles are still topographic in nature. And, and these topographic maps have a, a really important uh, feature to them in that they provide this bridge across species. So at the beginning of the talk, I highlighted how different the folding patterns are across primates, across marmoset, across macaques and humans, but also even marmosets, even smaller brains and even fewer folds. So you'd be hard pressed to establish parallels of function based on anatomy alone. But each of these primates have a series of retinotopic maps. So each of these primates have a visual area V1 and adjacent to that is a visual area V2, and then a series of other visual areas such as more interior, there's a visual area that has similar functions uh, across these species such as uh, area MT that's motion sensitive. And all these areas are located in similar parts uh, relative of, of the brain relative to each other across these primates. So the, these retinotopic maps provide this bridge uh, across, across primate species uh, that, that may be promoting these common uh, behaviors, or at least visual behaviors in this example, uh, that, that are common across primate species. Now, uh, the visual maps provide this bridge across primate species where folding and, and anatomy varies considerably, but also maps within species provide a bridge across individuals. And that is retinotopic maps uh, are highly predictive of the particular folding patterns within individu uh, across individuals within a species. And that's been shown for humans and monkeys, especially for primary visual cortex. So that's to say that if you knew, know the organization of the retinotopic map of V1, you would, do, you would be able to predict whether you are on a gyral fold or within the sulcus within that species. And so we were wondering whether there is such a systematic relationship between the folding and functional organization of IT cortex, specifically whether folding predicts face patches. So we know that maps predict face patches. Well, given that there's a correspondence between maps and folding in early visual cortex, is there a correspondence in between folding and maps in higher order areas such that folding would also predict the uh, location of face patches. And uh, to cut to the chase, that's exactly what we see. So we've looked now across a couple dozen monkeys and we find in each of these monkeys, three, uh, what we call bumps, they're small sort of con, uh, convex protrusions uh, with, buried within the STS sulcus. So they're not quite gyri, they're, they're smaller features than gyri, uh, but they, they have that sort of bulging feature to them. We find three bumps, a posterior, middle, and anterior bump that are located in stereotypical locations relative to other broader anatomical folds. And these bumps in particular are predictive of face selectivity in individual monkeys. And so I'm showing you here a composite image of face selectivity across seven different monkeys, uh, which parts of cortex are selective for faces. And so each of these bumps uh, have face selectivity within those bumps. Uh, so so there, if you know where the bump is, you can do a good job of predicting face selectivity. However, these bumps are not synonymous with face selectivity. So I'm not saying that they're, and they're certainly not sufficient for the presence of face clusters. 
Uh, so first, the face selectivity tends to be more on the lateral extent of the bumps. So it's not like if you know the whole extent of the bump, that is the full extent of the face cluster. Further, all the monkeys that we've raised without seeing faces that don't develop face selective clusters still have these bumps. And they're morphologically, the, the topology of the bumps are indistinguishable from, from our evaluations to monkeys that have face patches. So we think that this indicates to, that these bumps are probably are not the same thing as face clusters, but are maybe uh, part of the early architecture that's adding some architectural constraints, some constraints on circuitry and how the how IT cortex is wiring up and refining its selectivity. Uh, in support of that, similar to the retina topic maps, these bumps are there really early. In fact, because these are just this is just anatomy and we can do anatomical scans on, on fetal monkeys, uh, we see that even in gestation day 135, these bumps are present. So they're, they're really early on like the maps, way before face patches emerge. And we know that uh, sulcine gyri, basically convex and uh, concave folding, uh, has a relationship to the, uh, the, the sort of long range connections uh, within and between sensory systems. So if these bumps are there very early on, we think that that's evidence that uh, there's early anatomical constraints uh, within the STS. And in support of that, we've been looking at the laminar organization within these bumps. And we find with myelin and nissl and cytochrome oxidase sustains that the laminar profiles within these bumps differs from the surrounding STS cortex. And so together, this, we think that the, the stuff is there really early on before, uh, before face domains emerge. And so that's providing uh, an early architectural constraints for how uh, STS uh, wires itself up and, and, and inter is interconnected with, with other brain regions that may be promoting the de development of these uh, specializations such as, as face clusters. And we think that it's not just uh, bumps that are, are part of the, these anatomical constraints, but uh, sulcal pits as well. So sulcal pits are the deepest points of sulci. Uh, and so recently in a collaboration uh, spearheaded by Vaidehi Natu, uh, uh, as well as Colony Grosspector uh, at Stanford and, and with Kevin Weiner at Berkeley, we looked at the relationship between sulcal pits and scene selectivity in macaque monkeys and humans. And we find that the sulcal pit uh, in the corresponding sulci of these um, species is predictive of scene selectivity. So there's this commonality across species and there's a developmental trajectory to this such that the, this structure function relationship is stronger in adults than it is in kids. Um, so combined, uh, it, it, this indicates to us that these early morphological features are, uh, or these morpholog morphological features are present at birth and are providing early architectural constraints, anatomical constraints uh, for the subsequent functional maturation of IT cortex. Moving forward, um, we're, we're uh, in collaboration with Kevin, we're looking at uh, specifically quantifying the laminar organization within these face patches. So we have macaque monkeys that we've scanned and uh, it's a long-term project where uh, we are, uh, eventually these monkeys reach their sort of endpoints and we're performing histology on them. And now we're linking that fMRI with histology and can systematically and quantitatively uh, evaluate the laminar profile within these face patches in relationship to the broader bumps as well as the broader STS organization. Uh, to, to look at you know, are there distinctive features that emerge uh, within these face patches with respect to their laminar organization. Uh, as well with Marge, my, my uh, postdoc advisor, we're also looking at connectivity patterns within the developing brain. And so we're actually looking at uh, using diffusion tensor imaging on uh, ex vivo fetal brains to look at uh, long range and, and local broad connectivity patterns and whether those patterns within face patches or within the bumps are diagnostic of, of their functions. Uh, so this is sort of ongoing work where we're just getting started. Uh, so in addition to these early architectural constraints, uh, we, we've been looking further at how early visual experience may be driving or to what extent the, the, this early visual experience is driving the specialization of cortex. Uh, and, and on that note, there's this disconnect with how we typically evaluate selectivity within, um, uh, within IT cortex 
with how we think uh, the visual experience is driving the formation. So just to make that a little bit more clear, we take a monkey, we record from a monkey in the lab. We usually show the monkey images, these isolated objects such as faces, blenders, chairs, and, and coat racks. And then we'll record from a whole bunch of neurons and classify the selectivity and say, hey, this neuron really responds to faces more than these other objects. This is quite divorced from how we think the, the cortex is wire, getting wired up and, and the specializations are emerging. That these, specifically that these uh, specializations are emerging through experiencing these objects embedded within the natural environment. And the important point here is that there's a lot of regularity with which we experience things like faces or objects in our environment. Uh, and in particular, there's a lot of spatial regularity. So we don't just experience uh, certain objects uh, together frequently, but the spatial relationship with which we experience objects is highly regular. And this is highlighted nicely in this recent um, review paper by Kaiser. Oh, and this, this is super intuitive. This isn't saying something revolutionary, but super intuitive, like in an indoor scene, we typically experience lamps in our visual field above tables. We typically experience chairs on the same visual field plane as tables and carpets are typically underneath tables, right? But th this just to highlight that there's a lot of spatial regularity with which we experience our visual world. And we think that um, th the same group highlighted that, there, that this regularity uh, has behavioral relevance. So they had a, a, subjects detect targets embedded within an array of objects that had a regular spatial arrangement or an irregular spatial arrangement, such as this toilet, uh, the features of the toilet have a sort of spatial relationship with which we typically experience a toilet or an irregular. And subjects were more accurate at detecting targets such as the seahorse when they're embedded within a regular spatial arrangement than an irregular spatial arrangement. So we wanted to see whether neural tuning in IT cortex reflects these spatial regularities of our visual experience. So just to make this a little bit clear, looking at this image of, of Peter here, I think we would all easily and accurately identify where Peter's face is, where his eyeballs are, where his mouth is, where his nose is. And largely the, why we can do this is because we've experienced, we, we typically experience faces on top of bodies. And so P Peter's body is providing a strong contextual cue for where the face ought to be and where the features of the face ought to be. In contrast, Nina here, who's raised without ever seeing faces, would probably be very hard pressed at, at inferring what's underneath this mask. So to look at this relationship between faces and bodies, uh, we recorded from face patches in macaque monkeys. Uh, and given that we really wanted to look at the spatial relationship, uh, we trained macaque monkeys to fixate. And we identified in these neurons where the receptive field is, highlighted here in blue. And then we took these natural images and across trials presented that presented them at different spatial locations. And that has the effect on individual across different trials, having different parts of the natural image within the receptive field. Uh, so on this trial, a face was embedded within the receptive field. On this trial, a body part was in the receptive field. We can do this systematically by presenting at each of these uh, black dots. Uh, that part of the image on some trial was presented within the receptive field. So across a whole bunch of trials, we can systematically probe the whole image and stitch all that data together and create these nice looking maps, which uh, you can infer as activity maps such that the color coding indicates when that part of the image was in the receptive field, that's what the firing rate was. So for this image, when the faces were within the receptive field, firing rate was high. And when lower parts of the body or the hands were within the receptive field, firing rate was low. In fact, it wasn't different from baseline. So the, we did this in two macaque monkeys. In the first monkey, we had two arrays and two different face patches, a posterior face patch and a middle face patch. And in, every, uh, in all three arrays, in every image, we find strong selectivity when the faces were within the receptive field. And I think this highlights a really important part, point about the ventral stream that's often swept under the rug. So the sort of classic view of the ventral stream, dorsal ventral stream, ventral stream is the what pathway cares about object recognition often is emphasized that space, you know, these neurons are invariant to space. They, 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 uh, space is not important. But here, the actual selectivity for faces in these high level visual representations is retinotopically specific. And that's true throughout IT cortex. So next we wanted to ask, well, what happens when we include the faces? Uh, so we, we took images where there are faces and then we just uh, manipulate the images to occlude the faces themselves. And sure enough, in the middle face patches, we see strong responses to the faces and 
the parts of the occluded images where the faces ought to be. So now the faces are removed from the images, but these neurons are still firing. We see this for a whole bunch of different types of uh, occluded images, such as mast images. Uh, and sure enough, you know, the, uh, so I should say these monkeys were not face deprived. So these weren't the monkeys that we hand reared with these masks, but they did see us wearing masks in the colony room. So they had a visual experience of these masks, but it wasn't that specific visual experience that was necessary for driving this activity in these neurons, as images with other masks, such as this bag over the, this guy's head, still drove the neurons equally as strong as the type of masks that these monkeys experienced. In fact, you don't even need a mask. We used mannequin images, or even we just cut out the whole background and just had the body without a head positioned below the receptive field, and we still drove these neurons, which really indicates that it's the body that's facilitating responses within these neurons. And this, this body facilitation is orientation specific. So it's specific to the typical spatial configurations with which we experience faces and bodies. So we took the faces and replaced it with Gaussian noise and put it above the body. Uh, and then we recorded when the neurons were, uh, when, when, when the, the uh, bodies were positioned below the head or when the bodies were positioned above the head. And neural firing, this, this, this modulation by the body was strongest when the bodies were positioned below the receptive field as we typically experience faces above the bodies. Uh, so integrating this with our sort of model of how selectivity is emerging from, from an intrinsic topographic organization, uh, we think that these spatial relationships and the regularities with which uh, we experience objects within our environment uh, can, can be um, captured within this proto-architecture as well. And that's because, again, very early on, monkeys preferentially look at faces. That's not just imposing a regularity with which monkeys are looking uh, with which faces are experienced on this retinotopic organization, but by looking at faces and the regularity with which face, bodies are experienced with faces, then bodies are being experienced in a retinotopically regular fashion on cortex. And I think that, that can explain why in humans and monkeys, we typically see face and body regions right next to each other. In fact, the face regions tend to be on the, the uh, gyral crown of the STS, where the more foveal locations are. And then as you get more into the fundus, that's where the body representations are. And those have more parafoveal and per peripheral representations. All right, so I see we're at uh, 55. Um, just quickly moving forward, highlight a couple of future directions that we're doing. Um, we, wanna, we wanna understand how this early visual experience that we think is so important for develop, the development of the, the refinement of the selectivity for particular object features like faces emerges. We want to understand how these, uh, these tuning properties that are so typical of the adult visual system, such as uh, the uh, tolerance and invariance of neurons to uh, viewpoints and occlusion of faces emerges over experience. So neurons in IT will respond not just to faces, but they may respond to a face across a variety of viewpoints. That was nicely highlighted by some work by Vinnick Freewald and Doris Sow in face patches and macaque IT cortex. They'll respond to, as I just showed you, occlusion of faces. And in fact, some neurons will respond to the identity of the face irregardless of uh, different clothes that the individual may be wearing or different environments that the, the individual is in. And we think that these clusters are reflecting a refinement of the circuitry that's optimized for this invariance. So um, there's not really empirical work on this yet, but there's been some computational and theoretical work um, that have argued that maybe the clusters themselves are reflecting this optimization of the circuitry that allows for such flexibility and responses uh, of these neurons. And that, that remains to be seen. Uh, and, and moving forward, my lab is actually using a new animal model to study this, the tree shrew. Trishu is not a primate, but it has a primate-like visual system. It has a retina, sends information to the geniculate, relays to V1, has alternate pathway through colliculus and pulvinar and textrotrite areas. And importantly, there's a series of visual areas that are retinotopically organized, and they have some of the mesoscale architecture like pinwheel architecture that we know is in the primate. And the attractive thing about the Trishu is that it's in a way a very stripped down, simplified version of a primate visual system. And I think this could get us at answering what are the fundamental architectural features of the ventral visual stream that are necessary and sufficient for promoting 
the extraction of these high level uh, visual features such as faces uh, within, within higher level parts of the visual cortex. I think on that note, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, I have a little bit about continuous and discontinuous representations in cortex, but I, I think you know, if people have questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that. But I think on, I'll, I'll end on this note by just uh, acknowledging the majority of this work was done in my postdoc at Harvard with Marge, uh, as well as the postdoc at the time, Carlos, who now has his own lab uh, at uh, University of Washington in St. Louis, and Peter, who is a phenomenal RA who's now doing his graduate work with Vinrock Freewald. Uh, I also touched upon some collaborations uh, with members at Yale and Stanford and Berkeley. Um, and then the, the, the new work that I'm doing in tree shoes is, is with my lab members, uh, Marcelina and Jennifer. And thank you for your attention. Happy to talk about any questions. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we have time for a few questions. People can unmute them. Uh, maybe I'll start with my question. Um, so, so Michael, you talked about human faces. Uh, this is just an hypothesis. Just a hypothesis which I have. Uh, is there a role of high frequencies that is being played in identifying human faces? Uh, maybe high, high spatial frequencies. Yeah, high spatial frequencies. Now, here's yeah. a hypothesis. I grew up in a places around peacocks, <laughs> and in, if you if you think from peacock perspective, a lot of spatial high frequencies around the body of peacock and the feathers. Uh, yeah. So are as in, in uh, contrast to human faces, your eyes generally goes towards the body, uh, the lower body of the peacock and the feathers, right? Uh, which makes me think more about this hypothesis that uh, something related to spatial high frequencies or maybe there's something about motion also that is playing a role over here. Yeah, so let me, um, cause I sort of, not sure, I'm not sure I'll do this to show my hidden slides, but I'll reshare <laughs> my screen. Um, so I, I, I sort of skirted over the early visual retinotopic mapping study that we, we yeah. did in the monkeys. It was actually much more detailed than just looking at coarse retinotopic maps. Mm -hmm. That is, we also measured sensitivity to spatial frequency. I see. Uh, and this was actually really much easier to do in these monkeys than retinotopic mapping because we use just spatial frequency patterns. And it doesn't matter where the monkey's looking. It doesn't have to be retinotopically specific because the spatial frequency is held constant across the visual field. Um, so we didn't have to train these monkeys to fixate. They just had to be old enough to, to stay awake. And so after we, this was done about 100 days. We actually could measure sensitivity to spatial frequency, which could be argue, what I argue is a proxy for studying, for measuring receptive field size. So the sensitivity of different parts of cortex to, to the, the spatial extent. What we found was a variance of, a systematic variance of uh, spa sensitivity to spatial frequency that correlated with the eccentricity map. So basically, fulvial regions were more uh, were, were more uh, sensitive to higher spatial frequencies, and that's shown here for V1 and V4, and maybe less so for MT. But across all areas, all the retinotopic maps in these red regions are the regions of IT where face patches emerge. The more fulvial parts are sensitive to high spatial frequencies and the more peripheral parts are sensitive to peripheral. And this is early, in, this is at 100 days, um, this is the earliest we, we were able to, to measure this. And that's actually true in the um, human data too. We use spatial frequency. And at five months of age, you see this variance in, in, in spatial frequency. So I think that that's absolutely correct. Um, and to the point of, of your, your peacock comment, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I have it here but it's in the paper. We used a peacock image and recorded from them. And sure enough, all the little peacock eye feathers, we see these strong modulations. And I think that highlights not just the spatial frequency, but these neurons are sensitive to basically round contrasty things. Was, yeah. and I think that there's a sort of basis set of like what the representation, feature space representations are in IT cortex. And that's, that's something I didn't get to, but I'll just quickly highlight some beautiful work by Ping Lei Bao and Doris Sao recently that getting, gets at, I think, this fundamental map of object space in IT cortex where faces are just one part of that. And that's a part of the object space that cares about maybe high spatial frequencies, but also round contrasty things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Thanks, thanks. Uh, other people can unmute themselves and ask. 
Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm Quarantine. I'm actually, I'm from the Department of Neurobiology in, in, uh, at Pitt, so more from neuroscience. But, but here it's more like a, a question about a relationship with uh, deep learning models or things like that. And uh, so in the deep learning model, we, uh, we train a model and then uh, usually the weights are set. And then if we want to recognize something else, we need to retrain the model. Right. Here, uh, so the parallel is a little bit far, but here, do you think you can do do these uh, monkeys can develop um, uh, do do these uh, the, the the these 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 positions in the brain where they usually they used to have face patches, but you don't see the development of face patches in these regions. Can they recruit it for something else? Right. Yeah. And and also in the follow up, uh, if um, are they encoding the same ob um, similar objects, other objects? And is this encoding the same? Like at the end of your talk, you talked about a little bit of invariance uh, for objects. And uh, if these regions are not recruited right at the beginning for face, but for something else, do they would they encode the same thing or with the same invariance properties? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so this is something we, we're super interested in, um, whether or not there's the potential, or sort of first part of your question, the potential for that part of cortex that in a normally developing monkey with its normal visual experience develops face clusters to specialize to something else. Um, and we, we don't have a satisfying answer for that, unfortunately. We didn't see, for example, the hand area um, shift into the face region. That's that was one potential thing that we, we um, could have happened maybe is that that region maybe is just a sort of expertise region and whatever the monkeys become really good at, or maybe just look at a lot, that's the thing that be it becomes highly selective. And that's not what we saw. We only had three monkeys in the, in, in, in the, the published study. We have a couple more now. Um, what we see is that the hand region seems to be more robust in these face deprived monkeys. It maybe covers a larger extent. It wasn't statistically significant in, in the study, but again, we only had three monkeys and, and I think that's probably the constraint. But what it seems to be is the hand region is, the center of it is very much where it is in control monkeys. It's just a little bit broader. So it's almost like it's encroaching on the face area, mm -hmm. um, which, which I think is maybe, a, could be seen as a parallel to some of those classic silver spring monkey studies with the, the somatomotor reorganization where neighboring parts of the, the somatomotor yes. map encroach, but are largely constrained by the extent of horizontal connections. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're going to get a shift in the area. Um, but that doesn't answer, well, well, can the face patch become an expert in something else? And I think, yes. We don't really know exactly what that is, but we do know uh, that it's sensitive to high spatial frequencies. So that's one, one aspect of the constraint. The other thing is we know it's sensitive to curvature features. So we also test in our young monkey sensitivity to uh, round, basically round or rectilinear things. And we found that the part of IT that eventually develops face selectivity early on, even before the face patches emerge are selective to round objects. And so I think whatever it can develop a selectivity for must fit those underlying sort of intrinsic features. And, and maybe that speaks more to the, the, the work by Doris Sow that there's maybe this object space map. It's sort of a, maybe it's not the level of like specific faces, but like likes round things or contrasty things that are in full view space that have a certain spatial frequency profile. So I think objects that fit those constraints then could, could become th that part of cortex through experience could become specialized. And I think that specialization is really most reflected in the emergence of properties like invariance and sensitivity to, to translations and, and rotations, as well as uh, illumination differences or differences in contrast. Um, so I think that, that stuff, um, there's heavy constraints on where things can develop and what types of specialties can emerge based on this early topographic organization. But I, I, I don't think that's so limiting that the only thing that could satisfy it are faces. Great, thank you. And so actually to, to, you brought up the point of like sort of neural networks. And so I think this is an interesting, I think this, this sort of has an interesting suggestion for modifications to uh, neural networks such as AlexNet where, where 
uh, it might be worth imposing if you want to match that behavior to the behavior of the brain, imposing harder, to more, more strong uh, topographic constraints across the layers. Um, and, and matching these features, maybe things like uh, the, I think another thing that could be interesting is matching the, the sort of uh, scaling of receptive fields, which do fall out of, of uh, neural networks like AlexNet already, but uh, the size of different layers that maybe match the, the sizes of different cortical areas. Um, I think that there, there are certain architectural features that we know are really early in the brain that uh, would be interesting to implement more directly into the neural networks to see whether or not then that gets one closer to the, the behaviors that we see um, in, in primates. Yeah, exactly. I think there, there has been some attempt to put some retinotopy in, uh, yes. in uh, deep learning models, but I don't know uh, the, if they found any practicality for engineers to, 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 right. to keep them. <laughs> But uh, you may not, you know, Google may not want to implement this into yeah, yeah. The image search because, in, you know, with constraints, there's trade offs, right? It may be really efficient for a biological system that operates in the way we operate with our visual world, but that may not be optimal for when we want to find, you know, the best looking picture of, um, I don't know, like, you know, what to make for dinner or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. For example, you so they, they don't they, uh, in in uh, for engineers there's no eye movement and there's no yeah. displacement of the the focus. So there's yes. no there's no much need for a retinotopy. Everything is kind of a re retinotopically organized. But then there may be some uh, interesting studies uh, related to the the last part of your 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 research about the the contextual information and how natural statistics. And uh, yeah. the context in relation to the objects you're looking at may be like very important to encode to to better to improve the, the recognition of objects, for example. Yeah, and I think that there's there's data already on this that, that people have looked at these the sort of uh, whether or not neural networks like AlexNet could learn these these regularities through through training. Um, we actually put our stimuli through a pre-trained AlexNet um, and found. That the the deeper layers of AlexNet uh, actually the the representations of faces and bodies become much more overlapping. So very early on, if you just look at pixel intensity, this is actually quite interesting in itself. Uh, these isolated objects are very uh, separated. They're already based on like sort of just pixel wise similarity, which sort of combines maybe low level and higher level. Uh, image features, faces are already quite distinct from bodies and other types of image categories. And Pat, looking at different layers of AlexNet, we find in, in uh, uh, deeper layers, the face and body regions, which start off quite separate, uh, are, are much closer in their, their uh, representational space. So that, that's to say you pass a, a body through uh, AlexNet, you look at the activations and you use that spatial pattern and evaluate the similarity across faces and bodies. And is a super complex graph, but just to highlight, uh, this is looking at that spatial similarity across different layers of AlexNet, and we have faces and bodies within. So uh, the similarity between examples of faces and examples of bodies are highly similar across uh, AlexNet layers. But what we see is actually in the, the deeper layers, the similarity between faces and all other um, object categories that we test remain pretty low, except for faces and bodies, which actually curve up and start to become pretty similar. In fact, in the deeper, deepest layer, it's um, almost as similar as the similarity within the body category. So, and I think this is, this is just emerging through the training because in ImageNet, the th you know, ImageNet doesn't have faces, right? Uh, <laughs> there's not explicit labeling for faces, there's, there's like animals. But animals have faces and bodies, and they're experienced together with a high degree of regularity in that training set. And so I think this is just emerging from that training, and I'm sure that's how the brain is doing it too. Right. Thank you very much. And one last question. I think Adam has a question. Yes. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, what you think of the internal representations of objects and of multi-object scenes, and how those representations might be different, because it seemed like from, from one of those plots you're showing with the four axes and uh, you were talking about spatiotemporal profiles of objectness, I, I guess, or object. Yeah. Um, this seems hmm. close to an idea of 
uh, building prototypes for what objects might be like. Um, and then you can sort of measure how close you are to certain prototypes on different axes. Um, but for multi-object scenes, it seems like there has to be some kind of a looser or kind of analogy making kind of thing going on where to be able to recognize the thing above the table, uh, or, or sorry, to, to improve your recognition of the ceiling fan, you also have to use the same mechanism to know that there could also be a chandelier there or just a light or just nothing. And so there are these multi-object relationships that can have uh, objects swapped in and out. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that's not a very clear question, but I'm wondering if if you think there's a very different way that, pe that brains are representing objects on their own versus collections of objects and, and context. Right. Yeah, so what we what we find with our neural recordings is that the the even though the, these neurons respond to well the neurons typically when you put in an object or a couple objects in a receptive field and there's actually been studies looking at like sort of multiple object sensitivity to multiple objects so if you put like two objects in the receptive field uh, what are the responses to those two objects versus each object in isolation uh, and the, 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 I believe those studies largely show that those responses are additive. So if you were to like put a face and a chair in a receptive field, and you measure the magnitude of that, the firing of the, the neuron, uh, but then you just put the face in separately and the chair in separately, the responses of those separate ones will add up to the, the combined. Um, there may be a ceiling effect that if you sort of, there may be a sort of biologically maximal amount that you can drive a neuron. And so if you reach a stimulus, that maximally drives it, then it's sort of asymptotes. But putting that sort of um, caveat aside, um, in a way, you can sort of reduce the sensitivities of multiple objects to individual objects. But there's this question of like, well, how are neurons developing the sensitivities to a wide range of objects? Um, and I think that that to some extent, there there is these intrinsic constraints, such as like maybe like an object space. Uh, but certainly in the object body relationship study that we, we showed, these neurons are sensitive to, um, to bodies and those have very different visual features. And it's not clear how that se selectivity is emerging right now. Um, it's not that the bodies themselves drive the neurons. So if we put the bodies in the receptive fields, the neurons don't really fire at all. They really have to actually be outside the receptive fields, which suggests to us that those neurons are being driven by the body driving receptive fields in some other part of the recept of, of IT cortex or the other part of the brain. And those neurons are communicating with the face left of neurons. Um, and so that, that, that requires then a population of neurons and interactions. And we're not so sure if that's a, that can be resolved in a feed forward sense or in a required top down. I think the, the example that I showed with the, with the AlexNet suggests it could be feed forward because obviously that, that's, um, the, there, there's the, that, that's solved in a very much a bottom up fashion even, um, even though the, there is the training has like a sort of labeling scheme after um, for, for how these, uh, the weights are being modified. But uh, another hint about what th this might be a bottom up um, uh, learning uh, that this might be bottom up is that we record from a posterior middle face patch and you can see that there's a timing difference. So when faces are in this posterior face patch, even within 50 to 90 milliseconds, the neurons are firing, but the more anterior face patch is not responding yet. And it's not until 90 to 130 milliseconds, uh, the middle face patch is responding. Now under occlusion, we see that the responses are delayed, which is interesting, but we still see the more posterior area signaling a face before the more anterior area. Uh, and so we see, we think, and this is true for other types of occlusion too. So we think that this body facilitation might be uh, solved not by a top down, but by, by refining the local circuitry. So there may be some recurrent processes going on in IT cortex where neighboring body selective neurons are modulating the face selective neurons. Or this may be even solved in a feed forward fashion where the neurons that normally feed into body neurons in IT cortex are somehow that circuitry is being refined and modulating the face selective neurons in IT cortex. So, so, so like the neurons are not body selective but are 
sort of the, the building blocks within early visual cortex that are feeding into the body selective areas in, um, in IT cortex maybe also that through experience we're finding its circuitry and, and uh, capacity for modulating the face selective neurons. So I think it's sort of a long-winded uh, description of different findings that sort of say this is inconclusive. There's many possibilities of how this, uh, the, the sort of sensitivity to multiple objects can emerge. But I think there's some important distinctions about whether or not that those the neuron itself is sensitive to multiple objects versus different objects are capable of modulating those neurons. Um, and I think, I think that uh, there's both factors and the, the sensitivity within the neurons. Like, so if you put an object within a neuron, how, how well does that drive that neuron? I think that may, may have a lot of, uh, that's where a lot of these sort of constraints of like an object space map, such as this, where the, the particular features uh, may be particularly important and where, so for example, uh, a, a neuron that comes to really respond to faces may never respond to scissors because those visual features are just so disparate from a face that if you put those uh, scissors within the, the receptive field of a, of a face neuron, it's not going to modulate the neuron. But you might be able to put the scissors in a part of the visual field away from the, the receptive field of the face where we'll typically see someone holding scissors. And given that, you know, maybe through seeing a person holding scissors repeatedly, and it, it, maybe that would be sufficient enough for driving those, those, those neurons. So I think that there's certainly a capacity for learning that, that requires interactions between populations and neurons um, that could sort of, uh, could, could go beyond the constraints of individual neurons and the, the, the visual features with which they can come to respond to. That's helpful. Thank you. All right. Let's thank the speaker. Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much. Let me stop the recording.